Welcome to the On The Edge Podcast with your host, Scott Groves. Hey, what's up, boys and girls? It's uh, Scott Groves with the On The Edge Podcast, and we're here with my new friend, uh, Jedediah, also known as Jed, also known as Jed Wallace, also known as the owner of uh, Wallace Keystone Consulting Group. And of course, of course, for our first live event, we're smoking a lot of cigars. That's how I met Jed, because uh, we were at the same cigar lounge together. We were both kind of speaking loudly on our phone, trying to find a retreat from our home office. And we're like, hey, it, it seems like we've got a lot of crossover. So uh, Jed is an Air Force veteran, so we immediately connected over the veteran community. He was big into logistics in the Air Force and now runs a company that basically empowers passion through business systems. And what I like is there's a lot of gurus out there that will talk to you about mindset or, you know, I obviously have my book on lead generation or, you know, it's all about drive, 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 drive. And then a lot of times what gets left behind is the build. And so the build, the systems, it's like, all right, cool. Here's how to, how to create a pipeline or a funnel or an Instagram following of a million people or 20 deals in your pipeline. And then it's like, okay, well, well then what? Like you've got your core values, you're throwing lighter fluid on the sales, but if you don't have a system or you don't have good logistics, it all blows up. Uh, he's also the father of five kids, so I'm guessing his wife is a saint, although I have yet to meet her. Uh, and so what did, I, what did I miss in the 60 second Reader's Digest introduction of Jed? No, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. What, what, one thing I did forget to mention is I, I didn't even know this was a thing. Uh, when he was in the Air Force, and I think I had heard about this in the Army, but I just never knew about it, is that if you created um, functional efficiencies or logistical efficiencies, the military would actually pay you for finding those efficiencies and making yeah. those corrections. So I think when we were talking, you said you made more money from the Department of Defense by fixing stuff for them than you actually did on your uh, Air Force salary. Is that correct? Almost, not quite, okay. not quite. Can but, you tell us about that? Like how does one yeah. find efficiencies in the military and get paid for it? So um, everything in the military is done by checklists. It's all done by processes and procedures and obviously errors creep in. And so um, they had a program while I was in, I don't know if it's still ongoing, where if you even fixed some punctuation or anything like that, they'd, they'd write you a $200 check just for fixing a comma or a period or, you know, correcting something like that. If you manage to do anything to improve it, they'd split the benefit with you 50-50 up to, I think it was $50,000 was the cap. They didn't want to pay you more than that. So doing little things like, hey, we got to run over to this truck, and then we got to run over to this truck, and then we got to run back to this truck, and then we got to run back to this truck, just rearranging it so you do everything over at this truck, saves maybe 10 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, but that's per bomb, per loadout, per sortie, per unit, per base. And so it adds up real quick when you start doing the man hours logistics behind all of that. So when I was a mortar man in Fort Riley, Kansas, if I would have found some typos in, you know, mortar manual 11 dash two, three, seven, whatever, I could have got paid 200 bucks a pop. And if I would have found a more effective way to move mortars from the right side of the machine to the left side of the machine or the tube or the, 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 the vehicle that we were using, I could have got paid for that shit. Uh, it depends on the service. Oh, I'm, I'm not pretty I, sure. I've, I've talked to a couple of army guys that were in, um, tank command and they seem to think that that sort of thing didn't exist, but I think it was because they were jealous. <laughs> you know, I vaguely remember now that we're talking about it, I vaguely remember a mechanic who, you know, some optical system on the Abrams tank is like insanely expensive, you know, like quarter oh, for million sure, dollars for, sure. for this scope system. And he found out that like, if you ordered the whole housing instead of just this component, it actually been, it ended up being more cost effective. And I vaguely remember we had like an award ceremony where he got a check for figuring out that if you just ordered the whole housing, yeah, it created two hours of extra work for the mechanic who's making $12,000 a year. Right. But you basically screwed the company out of like $80,000. So it was a good cost benefit analysis. And I, I think I remember him getting like one of those big checks. One of those big fake checks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which <I've> is got... <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> I, I, I was the recipient of a couple of those fake checks. Nice. Um, 
So what specifically did you do in the Air Force? So I was a weapons troop on aircraft systems. So what that is, is uh, somebody's got to make sure that everything from the button the pilot presses to the munition exploding on target works. So I was in charge of every computer, every targeting system, every all the mechanical and hydraulic systems to actually make sure the missiles left the aircraft and that make sure the guns actually fire. And then also to load all the ammunition and missiles and bombs onto the aircraft. So... I played with high explosives, hydraulics, electronics, mechanical systems, the whole nine yards. Did you ever drop one? Yes. Okay, dude, tell us the story, please. Um, so we were loading uh, on the B-1. It can carry 2,000-pound class bombs, which really weigh about 3,000 pounds. There are 2,000 pounds of high-explosive tritonol inside of them, uh, and you... In order to load them, because of the way the bay doors work, you have to put them on this fancy forklift that has a boom that extends up and basically lifts it up where you can't see it all, and it's supposed to be all strapped down. And so we were lifting one of those up, and one of the straps broke, and the bomb just fell right in front of me, inches past my face, and smashed the cement to pieces. Um, So uh, that's how I started smoking. But did not go thing. off. So it did that's not good. go off. It did yeah. not go off. No, no, no. The, so tritonol is incredibly stable, and it actually takes a lot of kick in order to make it go off. All the fusing systems that are connected together have to go off simultaneously in order for it to work. So it was incredibly safe. It was just dropping a ton of cement, basically, right in front of your face. <laughs> um, so that was, I think that was like eight hours into a 10-hour shift, and we had been doing... We had been running sorties for a couple of weeks without breaks, and it was it was a high stress day. What does a, a sortie mean, day. by the way? Oh, uh, sortie is when you launch and land the aircraft. That's basically the the mission of the jet is is called a sortie from from launch to land. Nice. And was this in a training exercise, or was this real world wartime stuff? Or this was, if I remember correctly, and you're asking me to dig way far back, I think it was part of red flag exercises where we. Uh, as a nation, partner up with all of our allies, and we run war games out in uh, Alaska and all over the Dakotas, uh, and use some of the training range space here in Nevada as well, and we basically fight pretend enemies and see how well we work together as allies and um, what sort of training and whatnot we can pass from one nation to another. So Interesting. So who are some of our big allies that like the, because you're an Air Force, so who are some of the big, you know, air superiority allies, probably who we're selling all this shit to anyway, that we would, uh, that we would partner with? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the red flag exercise is largely focused on the Pacific area. So our big allies in there were like Britain, Australia, Japan, Korea, uh, South Korea, obviously. Um, and a few of those others, and we would basically pretend to kick the pants off of, uh, you know, China, Russia, or uh, North Korea, depending on what the particular mission was that that segment. And you know, with Japan, Australia, the UK, are, are do they have all of our equipment because we just sell it to them? Like, is it all kind of uniform? Like, if you're Pretty if you're close. loading up a bomb on a US jet, it's about the same as an Australian jet. Fairly close. There's a lot of. We, we've sold a lot of the 15s, 16s, and uh, 18s uh, from the U.S. fleets over to our allies. They also have a lot of their own development. Um, I want to say the Tornado is one that the Brits and Australians use a lot. Um, when you say the 15, 16, 18, you mean the F-15? The yeah, planes, the F- uh, sorry, the F-15, the F-16, and the F-18, which is actually a Navy bird, but still one of the, one of the big ones because yeah. um, it's very... It's a very multi-role aircraft. Is F-18, is that straight out of Top Gun? Is yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's the one that has, uh, so it's got two engines in the back, and then it has two tail pieces. Yes. Um, yeah, this is yeah, straight right out of Top Gun. Straight out of Top Gun. Nice. Um, we'd always have fun when uh, the Navy would come visit, because uh, here at Nellis, we obviously have the F-16 Thunderbirds, um, and they like to do all their fancy stuff. And so we had the Angels, which is the Navy's poor equivalent, uh, would come out, and uh, there was one time they came out and to try to show off. They were zooming down the flight line, flying above all of our jets, weaving in and out between the lights that are around. There, there were there were a couple of people that were shit canned that day, but it was uh, it was well worth every patriotic moment. I mean, that's straight out of Top Gun, like yeah, Buzz no, the Tower no, type yep, shit. Yep. Oh yep. man, that sounds <laughs> that's so awesome. exactly what it was. So exactly my, my uncle, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, probably my aunt's, I don't know, second, third, fourth husband, she's been married several times, uh, he was a air traffic controller for the, um, 
uh, Navy and did radar, sonar on a ship, air, you know, air traffic control type type duties. And uh, when he was out in San Francisco, I can't remember the Navy base there. Uh, he was in charge of the Blue Angels and mm-hmm. their flight mm-hmm. paths and all that type of stuff. So for years, and I don't know what happened to it, I had this gorgeous framed Blue Angels poster. I got to meet them all as like an eight-year-old in their flight suits and stuff. And it was, for, for a kid, it was the coolest thing. It was like meeting a superhero. You know, like, and then you go lie. out for for adults. It's the for adults, it's the coolest. Thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> and then you get to go out. You see him doing all these aerobatics, and you're like, dude, how can a machine do that? I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing propaganda. <laughs> is what it is to get kids like me and kids like you to eventually sign up for the military. Yeah, no. Oh man. So, um, and then after this red flag type event, did did you end up seeing time in like a wartime theater overseas or we where'd deployed you end up a couple stationed? of times um, when I was serving with the B ones. Uh, we would deploy in support of Afghanistan and Iraq. So we would do uh, the B one. The B one B is a long range bomber. It was originally designed during the Cold War to be able to launch and take out targets in Russia if there was ever nuclear problems. Right. Well, so it has a boatload of fuel, really big engines, can go really fast, and it is designed for long, long range flight. We're talking 16, 18 hours of loiter time up in the air. We were able to repurpose it during Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts where we would fly way up high and we'd put the exact same cameras that those drones have on it. And so we would be at like our, our upper limit, 20,000 feet plus and be able to drop 500-pound GPS-guided munitions from way up there where no one could see us and just take out whatever we wanted whenever we wanted. Um, so we did a lot, of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of support that way. You know, Marine units or Army units would bunker down for the night, and we would watch through thermals the five miles around them. And if anything moved that we didn't like, we'd just blow it off the map. So you guys, where were you guys launching from? Were you guys like at, at Bagram's Air Force Base or were you in a different country because they had such long range capabilities? Like where were you at? We were nearby. Nearby. Okay, we'll just say nearby. <laughs> so, so you were nearby. Um, the, these B-1s can launch and mm-hmm. presumably fly a couple hundred, a couple thousand miles and then just kind of hover, hang out. Ha- hang out in a holding pattern. Just hang out. They just loop around, do a holding pattern, do figure eights, hang out over areas of, of conflict and whatnot. Um, so yeah, they'd launch and they'd travel for, you know, 45, 50 minutes and then they'd be in the conflict zone and control would be handed over to local assets and then it'd just be up to them to what we wanted to do and who we wanted to watch, what we wanted to take care of. And then they just stay up there until the sun comes up and the yep. soldiers can move out. Yep. They just stay man. up there the whole time and then we'd send out another one and they'd come back and. You know, I hear about stuff like that and I'm like, how did we effectively lose? Like, it's just. The, 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 the supply chain, the military might, the technology, the air superiority, you just hear stuff like that. And it's like, for the U.S. to lose any type of armed conflict, it almost feels like we have to try to lose. Yes and no. Um, I think it's very safe to say that every conflict that we have <clears throat> lost in recent military history in the U.S. has been a conflict that wasn't lost on the battlefield but rather lost in the the hearts and minds, right? right? You're, you're talking about, so Afghanistan is a great example of this. Afghanistan wasn't ever really a country. It's a collective of hundreds of tribes, some who don't even speak the same languages, um, trying to get them all to agree on a common anything is a pain in the neck, um, And to be honest, you know, the CIA trained and funded bin Laden. So we used Afghanistan as a proxy battlefield during the Cold War. And then we come in and we tell everybody that now he's a bad guy. Um, And they're like, a lot of those warlords, um, now I am am not at all a political science major. I'm just just telling you what my opinion on this is. Of course. Um, A lot of those... Warlords that we looked at as, as horrible people were were held with a certain sense of um, respect by the local populace because they were taking care of them. They were right. the guy that was actually making things happen for them. They were the local governance, um, and they were They're protecting them. Chain. They were the supply chain. They were the, so those those types of conflicts 
aren't lost through military might, but rather lost through through diplomacy, lost through disconnecting culture. Like we couldn't even you, you, you go over to a culture that believes that women aren't on the same page as men and you're trying to get an American black woman to be the translator to try to get two grown-up men to agree to not attack each other because one believes seven cows is worth this much and one believes six cows is worth that much. Like, you, you're just, you're you're setting up for failure yeah. in a lot of ways. I, I kind of uh, equate it to, like, if you could drop me back in Shakespearean England, like, yeah, we, we both speak English, but not right. really. Not it's like really. we're not effectively speaking the same language. We don't have the same vocabulary. There's so many cultural barriers and so many, just so many differences. And right. so, you know. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It's and, tough. You know, we did a, we did a round table with three veteran friends of mine that all had very, very varied experiences. One was a, you know, military shoot anything you see, Marine, forward recon. Um, one was a Air Force guy who sat in a, basically a listening plane all the time. And then another guy was a Army logistics officer who worked for like the battalion commander and the generals at Bagram. So it's like a, a really wide variety of experiences. And we had a conversation after everything fell and it was actually a really good, um, really good podcast. I think we went like three and a half hours and had to splice it into two parts. Um, and a couple of the guys were saying, yeah, it's crazy. When you were boots on the ground over there, um, the, a lot of the locals thought that America invaded Afghanistan, so Afghanistan um, took retaliation with September 11th. Like, just, just the basic facts of the timeline, you know, the local warlords, tribes, definitely the peasants, they had no clue. They, you know, they don't have Google. They don't have internet access, for the most part. Um, and it's like, just the, just the series of events that led us there had been completely bastardized. It's like, how do you even have a conversation where they're like, well, of course, September 11th happened. You invaded our country. It's like, no, that was September 11th, 2001, not September 11th, 2002. It's like, no, you attacked first, so we had to attack back. And it's like, when you can't even get, like, the facts of the, of the, of the opening volley um, out to the general public, like, what chance do you have? I mean, it's right. pretty crazy. Um, so not that you can say exactly where you served to stage the B1s, but, um, what was some, what was some interesting stuff that you found in, you know, maybe training, um, you know, learning your job, doing the, the mock force on force versus when it's really game time? Does it, does it feel like the same thing or is there a heightened level of awareness or like, you know, I, I, I equate it to, I trained really hard for three years in the army, but I got out September 11th, 2000. So I never had to shoot at somebody or get shot at in anger. I definitely never had to load a bomb that was on its way to kill somebody. And so in some ways I feel when people say like, oh, thank you for your service or your veteran, I feel a little fake. Cause I'm like, yeah, but I didn't really shoot anything or get shot at. And it's like, I can't imagine the chasm between shooting at targets, learning to cover and move in basic training versus like, oh, now you're really getting shot at. If you don't learn how to cover and move, like somebody's gonna die. Um, and all of a sudden the stakes are way higher. So for somebody in the Air Force who was loading bombs to go do what it was gonna do, what what was the difference in experience between training and real life? Or did it kind of feel the same? So the reality is it was it was largely the same. We train all the time. You remember this. You train all of the time. And for the Air Force, we're we're not in direct conflict. You know, I'm I'm an hour away from anything exciting happening. I'm right. I'm an hour away from where the rubber meets the road, if you will. Now pilots may tell you different, but from my perspective, it was it was the same. It was no different than our quarterly load evals. It was more because we got less time off during our, our stay over there. But the reality of it was is that you, you drill and you drill and you drill and you drill so that when the proverbial shit hits the fan, you know what to do and you just go. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd seen a 60 Minutes piece that was so weird, uh, and I think this was at the beginning of Afghanistan, where they had a bunch of drone pilots um, out of Edwards Air Force Base in California where they would go do like an eight-hour shift, like a nine-to-five, like you're working at the local Applebee's, but on the screen, they're actively killing people um, by dropping munitions from drones. And then they would go home and have dinner with their family. And they were talking about, you know, it was the first time in human history that you could participate in a war, you could participate in sanctioned 
death of foreign soldiers and then go home and have dinner with your family. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that didn't even happen in the Civil War. It didn't mm -hmm. happen in the, in the Revolutionary War. And so just this crazy, like, what a mind fuck those people had where it's like, you're actively taking out people from, oh, I got the 10 o'clock to 6 p.m. shift and then I'll be home in time for The Walking Dead with the kids. And it's like, what, 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 what? I mean, it, it, just a weird psychological mind fuck. Yeah, and I think that they've been doing some studies on that and how much worse that actually is than doing a deployment. Really? Yeah, yeah. Just because of the the psychological disconnect between your your work and your day, uh, it's they they. I know they were doing some studies on the difference between like Air Force and Army deployments, mm -hmm. which is some of the same thing. You know, I would I would go and I would do my twelve hour shift, and then I would have twelve hours off, um, and we would be we would be running usually five on one off kind of a deal, um, but it like. There was there was a little definite disconnect between what I was actually doing and what the rest of my day was like. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so much more pronounced for people like the drone pilots. Um, <clears throat> and you you when you're on a deployment with your unit because of the group experience, it helps spread the the psychological burden of that. Because we can all agree that there's psychological burden in that. Whether it's good, bad, there's just psychological burden there. Sure. And so having that camaraderie in your unit to be able to spread that psychological burden, um, I want to say one of the studies I was looking at was talking about maybe one of the other times that we do this, we try to take those drone pilots and we just we don't let them leave the base for the four months or whatever so that there's not as severe of a disconnect between what they're doing on the screen and what their life is like at home. Yeah. Yeah, because I can't imagine, you know, I have a I have a bad day in the mortgage industry and a loan closes late and the, the house is not bleeding, the clients aren't dying, but it's like still you go home to your family at night and it's like I don't take it out of them or I try not to, but it's like hard. You know, your five-year-old does something stupid after you've just been getting beat up all day. You know, you want to beat up your five-year-old. I don't, obviously. But um, I can only imagine the heightened experience of like, Maybe killing a civilian. Maybe some. Maybe seeing somebody die on your screen that you could have saved had the munitions get in there early, and then have to go home and do fucking long vows versus short vows with your five year old kindergarten. I, I cannot imagine that's healthy for the human psyche. No, no, I, I really, really, really can't. So when we were talking the other day at cigars, you know, you said something that I don't hear a lot, which is I really, really enjoyed my experience in the military, and I got out. You, usually I hear people, I really, really enjoyed my experience and I stayed in, I was a lifer, I did 20, then I retired. Or, oh God, I was counting down the days. I, you know, I remember everybody in our unit because Kansas, Fort Riley, Kansas, when I was at, was the most boring place in the history of the world. We, we called it a double digit midget. Once you had less than 100 days left in service, it was like, you could kind of just screw off and nobody was gonna mess with you because they knew you had 99 days or less left in the military. So Tell us a little bit about that. Like, you loved it. You enjoyed it. You were actually making some good side hustle money by fixing systems and getting paid by the Department of Defense. Um, but then you also got out after your eight-year commitment. So what, what was that all about? So that just, that just boiled down to the tempo, really, is what it was. It was always a case of you can, you can take leave at your next unit. You can go do this uh, special duty assignment that you've been wanting to do for a while at your next unit. This unit, we need you to work. We need you to work. I loved the work. I loved the camaraderie. I loved my unit. I loved my guys. I loved my team. Um, my job was really spectacular in um, <clears throat> most maintenance in the Air Force, most of the guys that work on airplanes, they, they all just work at a more of a job right? You, and different people will be on different shifts and they move around and you don't really have a whole lot of very small unit cohesion. In weapons, we had to work in teams of three or four all the time. And they were your team. So you'd usually have like an E5, an E4, and a, two E3s would usually be how it's structured. And you did everything together. You were on the same shift, you worked the same job, you did the same loadout, you were constantly together. You went through the same training together. You went through the same. It was so I got to build some really awesome relationships and really loved that because because then as with me as an E4 and E5, I was able to mentor um, the younger airmen up into my job. 
um, and from a you know junior enlisted to a junior NCO position and all of the personal development that goes into that was really able to do that and that was really awesome it was really great um, but it was just a case of it was always at your next at your next you can do the special assignment at your next you can do the other thing at your next um, I also uh, had a bit of a medical issue that they squared away before I got out. My uh, my patella on my left knee liked to fall out while I was running. Oh, solid. Yeah, no. So I'd scream like a little girl, fall down, cry. Um, <laughs> so I ended up getting surgery to correct that. Um, and I gotten divorced and remarried and had another kid. And it was just, it was time. Yeah, yeah. Life gets in the way of military service sometimes. Absolutely, absolutely. It's funny. I I know a couple of buddies of mine, one who's actually still a colonel in special forces and then a bunch of special forces guys who have since retired. And almost every one of them tells some type of story of like, I loved it. I wish I could have stayed in forever, especially the guys that are like at the tip of the sphere. You know, they've got the coolest equipment and the best training and the best deployments. But they're like, you know, at some point, year 12, 15, 16, 20, 22, life gets in the way. You know, you've got mm-hmm. kids and you've got an ex-wife and you've got an ailing parent or whatnot. And it's just like the operational temple, like no human can keep that up for long because eventually life gets in the way. And if it doesn't, you become an alcoholic and it's a pretty rough, yeah. rough exit. No. Yeah, you you can see, you can see there are, two types that make it all the way through. There are the gung-ho, hoorah, go-getter types that are crisp and clean, and they're going to go up through the ranks, and they're going to do great things, and they get preferential treatment and all of the jazz. And then there are your guys that um, <clears throat> they show up smelling a little funny mm-hmm. and uh, never will make rank, and eventually they won't be able to retire. They'll just get forced out because they can't go up because they're just they're just borderline, but it's all they have. It's all they do, um, and I didn't want to play the games that are required for either one of those things. And had the opportunity to get out, and I originally had signed up for a six year, and it got extended to an eight year, but I didn't get the benefits of the extension. So I was like, you know, Time it's been real, out. it's been fun, but it ain't been real fun. It's true. Let's find something else. Can you talk a little bit? Because I think anybody who hasn't served, they hear this E3, E4, oh, E whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, those are just ranks in the military. You mm-hmm. started in E1. If you're the head of the Air Force non-commissions, you're an E9. I'm guessing same as the Army. Mm-hmm. Can you explain that delineation between going from E4 to E5? Because I think it's something where, like, sure, when you become sure. a non-commissioned officer, that E5 level, it's like, oh, that's kind of the first rung of leadership. And can you tell me what I, I think I know what it means from the army, but can you tell me what it meant in the, in the uh, air force to become an E five and really be, I'm guessing your first leadership position per se. Yeah, no, really it's uh, middle management is what it is. <laughs> it's middle management. Um, <clears throat> there's, you, you end up being a really good at your job, a real technical leader. Cause there's, there's actually two ranking systems in the air force that happen simultaneously. There's your your enlisted rank, which is your E1, E2, E3, E4. And then there's also your job rank, which is 3, 5, and 7, and 9. Um, <clears throat> and that's uh, apprentice, journeyman. Jeez, I should know this. Apprentice, journeyman, craftsman, and master. And that's basically a demonstration of how good you are at your job and what you're allowed to do. Because there are certain functions that you can't do if you haven't been trained on all of how to dot the I's and cross the T's and right. make sure everything's good. Um, so when you hit that, that really you, you start seeing it in E4. You're the last rank. Uh, it's a senior airman, so you're the last airman rank. Um, you start taking over more of the personnel concerns, more of directing the guys. You're the one that gets picked to figure out how to clean the whole building or whatever, and right. you get a squad of airmen that stand around picking their nose, and you got to go give them their tasks. And make E4 it is like the last bitch level. Like, yes. Like you're doing yeah. the last of the bitch work. Right. And then once you cross into E5, 6, and 7, that's your, that's your middle manager. That's where you'll, you'll end up being in charge of a shift, or you'll end up running, you know, 10, 20 guys instead of just the Gumbies at the end of the day. You um, you take on a lot more responsibility, and it's always paired with a increase in your skill as well. So 
you'll be able to, there, there's certain things, like on aircraft, there are certain things that the airplane can't fly if this is wrong. It's red x You can't get off the ground. Well, only certain people who are properly trained can sign a red x saying it's been fixed right. So that's one of the things, one of the criteria uh, moving up in that, that skill ranking system is you have the training and the capability and you've passed the tests so that you can actually say, yes, when I say this is fixed, it's actually fixed. Um, That's interesting because one of the other things we were talking about when we, when we met at the cigar lounge is, you know, you and I coming from the military both realize this, but I don't think most Americans do that, you know, in the movies you see the Navy SEALs pulling the trigger and in Top Gun you see the plane delivering the last 1% of the process to put a bomb on target. But really what the United States military is great at is logistics. Mm -hmm. You know, getting Mm -hmm. the butter, the bullets, the water from New York to the middle of Afghanistan. That's kind of where the real magic happens. And I know this is what you've now made your career about, you know, post-military. But can you talk a little bit about the the craziness of logistics in the military? Yeah, sure. So taking it just for example to get... To get two pilots in an F-15 off the ground requires the undivided attention of really close to 45 people for upwards of eight hours. That's to get it off the ground. To get it back on the ground again requires those same 45 people about six hours. So just in that, you know, in in a squadron, um, which will have multiple jets in it, they'll have 15, 16 aircraft. So you're talking about a unit that has between 150 and 200 some odd people all working just to get the stuff off the ground. That is not taking into account all of the people that are required in order to get those individuals the correct tools and training. Right. Because I mean, so wait, you're talking about 45 people at, you know, 14 hours of man hours to get the ship loaded or to get the plane loaded off the ground, back on the ground. You know, you're talking about... 600 man hours of work per oh, flight per mission. Easy. Oh, easy. And all we see is the final bomb drop. All we see is the final bomb <laughs> drop, right? That's all CNN ever shows. And you got to realize that each one of those guys, they have massive toolkits. So one of one of my responsibilities early on in my career was to take care of the tools that all four of us used. And we're talking a, a rolling snap-on chest like you see at the auto shop. It's about that big. It, you know, about... I don't know, yay high off the ground, big rolling chest, somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 tools that all have to be tracked and accounted for at all times because if one of those gets sucked into an engine, that that's no bueno. Yeah, um, might cost you a lot of money. And so all of the tools, their repair, their servicing, their care, because you gotta you gotta oil them, you gotta clean them. Dust gets in the air, dust gets on the equipment, rust, all of that stuff, all of that in the back side of the house, getting us the proper uniforms, getting us the proper PPE or personal protective equipment so that we're not drenched in, you know, oils and fuels and all of these other things, making sure that, you know, our, our dorm rooms are set up correctly, that our pay is going through correctly. This stuff doesn't happen by magic. It's all logistics. And so when we would deploy or when we would go TDY on, a, on like a special training session or something like that, the amount of effort put into making sure that we had the right equipment, we had the right tools, we had the right things, and they were going to be in the right place at the right time to coordinate all of that, like that was a monumental task. Yeah. I remember pulling into Fort Irwin. We did a force on force, you know, deployment thing in the desert of California, right outside of Vegas, actually, where you have tank brigades fighting each other and you have, you know, fake insurgents and whatnot. And I remember going, I I was part of like the advanced group that got, because I was driving for a captain. And it's like the train pulls in from Fort Riley, Kansas. And it's like, okay, cool. There's our, um, you know, there's our company of, you know, six or eight tanks. And then they're part of a battalion, so maybe there was like 20 tanks, and they're part of a brigade, so maybe there was like 80 tanks. And it's like, oh, cool, there's the train with the 80 tanks. Oh, but here's the next three trains with wreckers and fuel trucks and Humvees and support vehicles and, you know, um, indirect support vehicles, which is where our mortars were. And it's like, oh, there's three other trains of shit 
just to make sure that the tanks work. Because in, you know, Desert Warfare, the, 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 the Abrams tank is the tip of the spear, but there's like nine vehicles behind it supplying food and gas and water and indirect support. I mean, it's just the logistics are crazy to move a small element. And then, I, I don't know, how many, do you know how many people were in country kind of at the height of Afghanistan? I have no idea. Have Chris, no maybe clue. you could look this up. Like, what was the, what was the height of troop uh, deployment to Afghanistan? I'd guess maybe 200,000, somewhere around there. I, I have we're no We're gonna have to look idea. that up. So I, I, this is a, putting you on the spot. This is an interesting guess. If, if the plane, so the F, uh, the B-1 bomber, mm -hmm. is like one unit of measurement of mm -hmm. stuff, how many units of measurement of stuff is there to support that one plane? Is it like is it like 10x, 20x, 100x? What what do you think there might be in, you know, personnel, equipment, tools, bombs, fuels, food for all the people? Like how much x stuff? How long are we there for? Say we're there for like a 6-month deployment. 25 to 30x. <laughs> so crazy. It's so nuts. So it looks like in August of 2010 to May of 2011, there were 100,000. Okay, 100,000. And then that's when they started in June of 2011 is when they started trying to bring them home 10,000 at a time. Yeah, so there's probably 100,000 soldiers, 100,000 pieces of vehicle and equipment and support and another 30,000 Afghan nationals working with them. You know, that's a that's quite the large operation. That's a Fortune yeah. 500 company. Uh all right, so so you make the shift, you get out of the military. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty self obvious uh, or pretty self apparent here. But how does this translate into now running a company that empowers passion through better systems? <laughs> well, I don't know that it's really super apparent because it took me a minute to figure it out. Um, but the reality is, is that going back to the military, the U.S. wins wars through logistics. We accomplish things through doing of stuff. And if you want to do the stuff well and you want to do it efficiently and you want to do it reliably, that requires systems. We all use them all the time. Setting up this podcast was a system. Now, you have somebody else set up the podcast. How much work is that going to take them? More than I'm willing to do. More than you're willing to do and probably more than you realize. Yeah. If we were to take you and Chris and we were to take you and make you go sit in the car and have somebody else do this, it would not be done the way you want it to be done. It would not be done in the timely fashion you want it to be done. And there would be your phone would be blowing up with questions all the time just because of the communication of systems and the documentation of them. So that's where... Um, because I'm a nut job and I really enjoy writing checklists and processes and procedures and seeing how all of the pieces connect together in the puzzle, that's where we come in and what we try to do is we help you codify and document the systems that you're already following so that you can actually see what they are and be able to say, well, it doesn't make any sense that I'm doing it this way. Or, hey, this works really well and the clients really like it and they really enjoy this product. I didn't even realize how much impact this particular thing had. While all of this work I'm putting over here isn't doing anything for me. Interesting. And, you know, we talked a little bit about this being the founder's dilemma is like, you know, you, I, for example, I have a coaching program where we coach loan officers. It's like, okay, well, we kind of just started doing it and it was a phone call. All right, all right well, well, now we want to see each other face to face, so we upgrade to Zoom. And it's like, well, then you kind of get an assistant. And it's like, well, I'm kind of doing the banking and I'm doing the um, the sales and I'm doing the onboarding and I'm creating the content and, 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 and. And you get this founder's dilemma where it's like, you, you can get to half a million, a million, two million in revenue just by the founder or the, the couple founders white knuckling it and keeping all the stuff in their head. But eventually, you know, I've got stuff in my head. My executive assistant has stuff in their head. I want to make her the operations manager of the company. We got to bring in a new executive assistant. I'm like, Jesus, do I need her to just stare at me for a year to learn all the stuff that's stuck in my head and stuck in Danielle's head? So I think from what we talked about, a lot of the problems you solve is getting into these like not startup, but not huge companies and being like, hey, all the knowledge is in the founder's head or a few key employees. We got to systematize this shit because you guys are ready to scale. So can you talk a little bit about that dilemma and maybe how founders finally come to the realization that they need somebody like you? Sure, because you basically end up with two choices. You can hire somebody who's really, really good and they'll do a good job. 
and you'll have no idea what they're doing. That's delegation by abdication. Or you can keep on white knuckling and hope and pray. On average, it takes 30 times as long to train somebody to do something you do. Really? That's, that's the on average. So if you want somebody to be able to do what you do and do it the way that you do it and live and breathe it the way you live and breathe it, it's going to take them about 30 times as long to pick that up through just sort of an apprenticeship program, mm -hmm. right? So we just take that and say, look, you, you, you have to control. You have to understand what's going on. You have to be able to evaluate whether your employee is doing a good job, a bad job, whether or not you need a full employee or a virtual assistant or a vendor to be able to provide these things. But if you don't know what it is that you're doing and you can't articulate that, how on earth can you pick any of these things from a database perspective? It's just gut and guess. And gut and guess gets people a long, long way. And a lot of people have been very successful off of that. But the truly successful enterprises, you look at IBM. IBM started out and built his company the way he wanted it to look in 30 years. And he started there building the systems and processes that he would need in 30 years, even though he didn't use them now, so that it did flow and scale and was used. And now they form the backbone for so much more than we can imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the apprenticeship thing because Chris has been working with me, how many years now, Chris? Uh, probably five, six years? Six. Six years. So six years, and keep, keep your mic on, Chris. How many hours of content between the initial listen, the re-listen, the editing, how many hours of content between the podcast, the coaching, hearing me take client calls, just sitting in the office, how many hours of shit do you think you've heard me talk? Over a thousand hours. Oh, I think it's probably ten times that much. Like the podcast, we're at like we're at like sixty episodes. Let's just conservatively, that's hundred and twenty hours that you've listened to at least twice. Oh, but yeah, if you're counting my editing, yeah, because I do listen to everything you say like three times. Yeah, so that's a couple hundred hours. Then uh, countless hours. Your of master coaching. classes, your coaching, your live events. Yeah. yeah. And so I say this because I've known Chris since he was born. His older brother was my best friend growing up until I was, you know, into my 20s. We owned a house together even after I got out of the army. So Chris has known me since I was born. He's worked for me for six hours, for six years. I think he's, I think he's listened to me for probably tens of thousands of hours of content. And I finally feel comfortable him writing the scripting for some of our mortgage videos that we put out. And it's like, he's been listening to mortgage stuff for six years. And sometimes he still writes something where I'm like, oh, that's not exactly right. That's kind of cringeworthy. But it's like for him to do it versus me take the time to do it. it it's a fair trade off of time and money. And it's like, and that's six years and 10,000 hours later of him listening to me. I noticed the slight changes in the descriptions for the mortgage mysteries. Once in a while. I, I see them. <laughs> I see them. <laughs> once in a while. Once in a while I change them. But it's crazy because that's like a six-year internship, and we're mm -hmm. almost there where mm -hmm. I can trust them to replicate my voice. Um, so how much quicker how could I have done that had I found you and had real checklists and real systems in place? Look at McDonald's. Yeah. They can There's train, your answer. They can train an employee in like two days. Look at the military. The military manages to take 18-year-old, effective high school rejects, Yeah, right? That That's what we all were. Yep. That's what we all were. We had no idea what we were doing with our life. Take us and turn us into one of the greatest military warfighting machines the globe has ever seen. All with systems. All with systems. It's all systems from the get-go. Everything from, I remember the bus driver being a real pain in the neck before I even got to basic. All of that is pre-planned, pre-set up, pre-documented, has systems, has processes, has procedures. Not all of them are like, do this, say this. Right. A lot of them are in what, what I would kind of call the, the policy segment. We want to accomplish this feel, or we want to accomplish this end goal. Execute it however you see fit. But this is where we're going. This is what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And that's your simple answer right there. That's true. Because I think about go, showing up to basic training. You know, I grew up in, in uh, suburbia, Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles. Other than like the Boy Scout rifle and shotgun merit badge, I had never shot a gun. Mm -hmm. And within eight weeks of basic training and five weeks of AIT, so advanced individual training to be a mortar man, within uh, 13 weeks, I went from like, 
barely having a familiarity with a gun with being pretty damn proficient. I mean, deployable. I, yeah, deployable. I could have gone and fought a war. I wasn't, I wasn't a Navy SEAL, but like an M16, a nine millimeter handgun, an indirect mortar. So that could have been 60 millimeter, 81 millimeter, 120 millimeter. Like I was a pretty badass marksman with stuff within 13 weeks. I mean, that's crazy. And they also and they also had to have me running five miles a day and lose weight and have team camaraderie. So it's not like you were just doing 13 weeks of firearms training. And you add all of the heritage instruction, all of the military traditions on top of that, all of the how to fold your clothes and everything else that was inside of that. Like, it's a ton of stuff. Yeah. It's a ton of stuff. Yeah. Are, are you familiar with that? I think he was an admiral that gave a speech and then like a, a keynote uh, at the, what do they call that when you graduate college? I never did, so I don't know what it's called. When the when the keynote speaker gives out then delivers the whole, oh, what is it called? Chris, you got to look this up. What is the speech that the keynote person gives at the end of graduation? I'm so embarrassed that I can't remember what this is. Um, Wait, the valedictorian, like what's their speech called? Yeah, not the valedictorian. There's uh, usually like a keynote, keynote that, that or, gives like a, what, yeah. what's a keynote of graduation? People right now that are watching this is graduate college right. are laughing at us. They're like, these <laughs> sure. two fucking morons. Um, and they so, want they want to come in and help us with our business. God yeah, exactly. Can't yeah. even remember this word. <laughs> so um, so anyway, the guy gives a talk and then he turned- Commencement? Turned, commencement yes. speech, that's commencement. it. Thank you. That's commencement. what it was. Thank you. Thank you. Um, he, he gave this speech about making your bed and then turned it into a best-selling book about like using this military discipline to make your bed. You start your day every day, you make your bed, and that's like the first win. And then you just build wins on top of that. Because yeah, in the military, one of the first things they taught you, how to make your bed, polish your shoes. And it wasn't because they cared about cleanliness. It's because they wanted you to follow a system and a procedure. I mean, pretty nuts. Yeah. Oh, all right. So then um, tell us about you know, journey from exiting Air Force to now running your own consulting company, which is really focused on veterans here in the, uh, you know, Clark County, Las Vegas, greater metropolitan area. What was that journey like? And what finally clicked for you? We're like, dude, I really know logistics and checklists at a high level. Um, so I was fortunate in that I was hired by a, a low voltage installation company. So somebody comes in and installs camera systems and security systems. And it was run here in the Valley by a gentleman who was a Navy veteran doing the exact same job I did. So he was like, oh, this is awesome because I just have to replace words for you. We replace pilot with client. You already know how to deal with clients. You already know how to deal with people that are way too big for their britches, that think they're the boss of everything, that don't have any idea how anything works, and you know how to talk to them and communicate them. You just call them pilots. We call them clients. You know how to troubleshoot and design systems. You were doing it as aircraft maintenance. You were running through your checklist. You were making sure you were, ide you were identifying, isolating, and troubleshooting, right? How to break complex problems down into simple ones. We do that all the time. It's the exact same thing. You replace bombs with cameras. You replace um, you replace the control systems with NVRs. It's all the same stuff. It's exactly the same thing. So he was able to to take me on it and taught me a lot in the um, in the space there. And then um, I quickly became a project manager for them because I had spent a time a fair amount of time in the military serving as project management in a couple of different areas. Um, so they were able to capitalize on that skill for a little bit. And then me and one of my buddies started up a company in competition with them um, and ran that for a little bit and realized I really had a talent for the business operations side of things and worked part-time as a business development manager for a couple of IT companies. Um, and in that realized I don't really like doing sales. I didn't, I didn't. I wasn't feeling it. And so as part of business development, you're generally considered to do a lot of sales, particularly for small organizations. So they weren't getting what they thought they were getting. I wasn't able to do what I thought I was able to do. And so separated out into this organization and said, look it, I'll help you with the checklist. I'll help you design the processes and procedures. Sales is, sales is on you and it doesn't make sense for me to be your employee for this. But why don't we set up where I'll come in and I'll help. I'll build these things out. You give me some money. And we'll call it a day. Nice. And and how does how does that evolve? Like how does the um, you know, how does the Wallace Keystone Consulting Group like what what's your guys' secret sauce? You know, we talked a little bit about kind of your your six steps or your six beliefs in business. So that's not the secret sauce. The secret sauce is being able to listen. That's the secret sauce. Because 
everyone who started a company has an idea. They had a passion. They had a belief. They believed in what they were doing. They believed in the product they were delivering or the service they were delivering. Uh, they believed it so intensely that they went out on a limb and started their own business to do it because they could do it better than everybody else, because they could do it cheaper than everybody else, because they could do it more efficiently than everybody else. And they know what they're doing. They just don't know all of the things that they're doing. And so all we really do at the end of the day is we listen and take the time to write it down so that they can then see it. How many things have we learned or looked at? We find something on Wikipedia. We look at something online and we're like, oh, yeah, I did know that. And obviously because of this is true and this is true, then this is true. We can all do that. But if you don't really understand everything that goes into it and you're not paying attention to those things because you don't think that they're important, you can't make those effective decisions and really be able to capitalize on your own abilities and your own experiences. So our secret sauce really is, is just being able to articulate and codify what it is that makes you different, that sets you apart, that, that drives you and produces whatever the service and product is in it. 